fantastic to see all you guys here today as usual. So um, first I want to say uh, thank you again to everybody, our volunteers and everyone who's here today for our special mixer that happens every month on Wednesday. Uh, this event is being live streamed, so if anybody wants to catch a recording of this afterwards, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. Last call for snacks will be at 8.30, so if anybody needs to get a snack, you can do that. And after our presentation, we're going to leave time for you guys to mingle and mix as well, too. So stay tuned. After our guest is done speaking, you can come speak to the guests. You can speak to everyone in the room. I do encourage everybody to reach out to new folks, new faces who are here that, you know, might not have met other people before. So, like, uh, let's mingle and let's mix. Uh, also, Mix, Mix Mixer, we're actually going to have women in animation collaboration with the KSU chapter and the Atlanta chapter. So anybody who is also here today for the uh, women in animation, if you want to get your points, please sign, uh, go see Luz over there. Luz is waving. Yes. But we would definitely, hi, I'm sorry. Uh, we would definitely love to see you guys at the next Mixer because we're going to have portfolio reviews. We're going to have guests coming out from uh, Primal Screen, from uh, Awesome Inc. It's going to be a really good get together. Whoa, is our battery off? It died. Da, da, da. Oh, no, it's good. That's cool. Okay. So uh, thank you everybody again for coming out. And then um, please stay tuned for our next Mixers. Uh, in the future mixers, we might also alternate some locations to switch it up a little bit as well, too. So we'll keep you guys informed about that. <laughs> yeah, so let's go ahead and enjoy. And Maya, who is our operations coordinator, is going to host us. And for anybody who wants to volunteer with us later on, outside, um, Adam, our, our volunteer coordinator is outside. So if you ever want to volunteer with us, Please go ahead and sign up on our email list or ask him about it, and then we'll have some volunteers here who are helping. Sorry, Mara. I'm a boss for Ginger. Woo! All right, I'm going to make this quick <laughs> so that Jeff can have the mic. For those who don't know, Jeff is our SIPA South Executive Director, and he is an Unreal artist and a VR technical artist at Pulseworks. He also runs his own company, Slow Peak LLC, and we're excited to see some of his boarding and previous work from features and games. Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Round of applause So how many of you here are, are still students right now? All right, a lot. And how many of you have just graduated? A good amount. And then uh, how many of you are already like working in industry, uh, you know, art related or you know, programming that amount? Great, welcome. So uh, today my speech, my talk is going to be mostly about you know going from you know being in the student position all the way up until where I'm now working in industry for almost a decade now. And so that's why from concept to reality, the idea behind that is that, the idea is that, um, you know, when you're first beginning off, you're kind of the diamond in the rough, and you don't quite know which direction you want to go yet. But as you go along, you start picking up little skills here and there, and then you find ways where how they're all related, and that takes you to a whole new direction that you never even thought you would have been in. And uh, you'll eventually see how all of that's uh, related. So if you see over here, for example, I love taking uh, photographs of uh, you know things I see when I'm on a walk, or if I'm at a museum, or a botanical garden. So that was actually in one of the in the painting you saw in the uh, slide before. Um, so I use a lot of that in my own work too. So a little bit about myself: I graduated from SCAD, uh, 20, 2012. Uh, I, that's when I graduated with my uh, bachelor in animation and special art. And then uh, in 2021, I graduated with an MBA in entrepreneurship. And uh, now I'm living in Georgia. But uh, as you can see here, I've lived in most of the East Coast, traveled along there, and I've also been in California for a year, and then back again to Georgia. So um, I am a, uh, I would say that I'm a concept artist, but I also do animation on the side too. And uh, now I'm also doing VR content development at a company called Pulseworks. So, uh, so these are just some uh, many different hobbies I have. You know, I have some geeky tendencies, building models. Yeah. 
I also enjoy, uh, you know, just collecting weird doodads from, you know, like military stuff to all the gears and gadgets are really cool. Um, science stuff, you know, going to museums and uh, FIFA South and teaching kids uh, arts are all like part of what I do too. And then this is Ginger and me. Uh, Ginger's my lovely wife over here. And, uh, for her <laughs> so for her birthday, we went uh, shark diving at the Georgia Aquarium. And uh, for me and Ginger, we both love like the aquarium and museum sort of locations. So you'll see that crop up later on in some of the stuff I do. So in my early work, this is around high school period, so 20, uh, 2006 to 2007. Uh, you can see me, you know, just drawing, you know, really basic anime-ish style sort of artwork. Um, I also did a uh, paint, a watercolor painting of uh, a character Ichigo from uh, uh, Bleach. Yeah, me, yeah. yeah, from Bleach, and apparently it also got uh, published in Shonen Jump as a runner-up for one of the cover art competitions. Whoa. So, Whoa. Whoa. Uh, then uh, once I got the scat, I started learning a little bit more about Photoshop, and so you can see some of my very early attempts at drawing. This piece here took me like eight hour plus just to get just to get here. Um, and then later on, it started getting faster and faster, and you can see some of the later ones where you can see a little bit of the anime style, but a little bit more realistic sort of rendering. Then by my senior year at SCAD, um, you can start seeing you know, more of the concept art aesthetic. You know, I will look up uh, videos with Feng Zhu, Scott Robertson, uh, follow Ryan Church, I'll read all sorts of art books uh, from all sorts of games like Mass Effect and stuff. Um, one of my professors, Nolan Woodard, um, was really, really strict on you know how you do the presentation, and he went through you know the whole step of the pipeline for creating concepts from you know your sketches to your silhouettes, and then to like uh, your final uh, environment designs. Then right about the time I graduated, you can see you know how my painting uh, techniques have started developing a little bit more. You know, like the like human characters, you start seeing more modeling. Uh, the lighting itself starts feeling a little bit more, uh, you know, ma uh, there's like a volume to the characters. Uh, this last piece over here um, I included because that's actually what got me my first contract job. So I went to SCAD's uh, career fair and I talked to this guy called David Dolceritz at POV, uh, Persistence of Vision. And they said that uh, they were doing a pitch for a project. And so they wanted me to do this uh, pitch board in a style that uh, I just showed you, right? Where you have that sort of gradient sort of design, and it's very colorful. Um, you have that golden hour sort of feel. And so this one, uh, called Safari, back in uh, 2012 when I did this, five years later, finally came out on NBC Universal called Safari. And uh, it's one of the first, part it's one of the cartoons that, that was produced in uh, Unreal Engine as a real-time animated show. And then along that time after I finished my contract job, I kind of hopped around doing internships. So during this time period, I had no job. I was just you know trying to figure out where I want to go. Um, you know, I was a high risk for a year doing animation. You know, these are mostly just uh, you know some tests and stuff I did for them. Um, I also worked for a uh, engineer who does uh, courtroom sort of presentations. So as you can see here, you have like wireframes where you see cars hitting each other, and they always do like UI and. Uh, of like what happens and uh, you know put that together for the presentation. And during that time period, I also jumped around to other game projects. So I started going to other conventions like GGDA. Yes. So I started going to GGDA, uh, which is the Georgia Game Development Association. There's also SiegeCon, which is usually in like October, November period. And so um, while while I started attending that, I started you know getting in touch with um, yeah a lot of game development teams. Uh, they cost us for them for free, but at that time I was learning you know, the pipeline of what 3D modelers would use and you know how they like stuff laid out, especially with different angles. And then even just environments, you can start seeing where uh, I'm starting to do more matte painting sort of techniques too. So I paint, I also bring in photos, I paint on top of photos, uh, I use 3D models. Um, some of the stuff is still, you know, still have the hand draw. Um, next one. But this is probably the titular piece during this time period. Where um, I come, where you see like really real, more realistic sort of uh, detailed rendering, uh, more breakdowns, and I got to a point where I could use that for for this scene right here, um, where you start seeing those you know, big scale, very epic sort of feel. Um, it's almost like you're in, you know right in that scene with them, you know, with this guy here who's about to throw like a plasma bomb at the uh, at the backup. Yep. 
So from there, when I was at GGD, I met up with a person called Spencer Reeves, who was at Cool Mini or not. And so um, they were doing a presentation on um, Kickstarter for board games. And so I never considered going to board games, but I had some graphic design skills, and they said they needed someone to do that. And so you know, we exchanged information, and they said, hey, you know, maybe you can come in you know, next week and you know, maybe try out for an internship. And they said they'll pay me for it, which is better than what I had before. So I'm like, okay, I'll go in and take a look and see what, what we can do. So I started off with this. This is just blisters. If you ever collect miniatures and models, they have these little back, paper backslip that shows you what the character will look like if you, you know, like, painted it. Um, but these are all studio painted, so you can probably get this quality too if you're really good at it. But if you try to test it now, you know, it's depending on your skill set. But uh, anyway, you know, I did a lot of these blisters. Then they start having me create these uh, assembly instructions for their bigger character, like the Capricorn, which is like that big. It's a big, it's a big build. And then uh, for the box part, if you like the top right, um, that was their original box design. It was just you know square, um, very simple sort of design. Um, but then they wanted me to uh, you know give it a little bit of a facelift. And so the bottom design is what I did for them. And you can see it has a little bit more of that you know, polish, like glow sort of feel to it. And so people would ask me, how many boxes did you do? So I did 133 boxes. <laughs> And then uh, from there, they were like, okay, well, we're going to create some games uh, in-house for uh, an upcoming project called Xenoship. And when I learned what Xenoship was, it's like a sci-fi world, um, a lot of like mecha sort of stuff, and I instantly jumped at it. I was like, yes, this is what I've always wanted to do. I love Gundam, I love, you know, Evangelion, um, you know, with the Mass Effect, all this stuff. So from there, they gave me all these items to work on. You know, I did uh, armors and weapons and drones, all the cars that goes into it. And uh, at some point, they decided to turn it into a Steam game. But, well, before that, uh, this is also when I uh, started working on you know, these big format uh, paintings. And uh, the details that I started putting into, you know, some of the rendering and the lighting, you know, some of the uh, scratch marks and stuff. Uh, yeah. So this would be the Steam game that's uh, still available now, if you uh, check it out. Um, it's a deck builder game, and you can do co-op with other people. There's other expansion packs for, uh, for like, more if you want to have fun. And then uh, just other projects I've worked on, like uh, Galaxy Hunter, like War Weapons and all that. And then later on, while I'm uh, at Comini, I, just, I continue you know, working with other uh, game development projects. So this one is in Unreal Engine, and uh, they were trying to create a sort of like horror detective game, um, and it's all like cult aspects in it. So I did like a quick, uh, quick set of concepts in a nine grid sort of format. Um, this is something I started doing more of instead of you know, just doing black and white compositions. Sometimes I'll you know just use big chunks of color and then I'll take a few photographs in and then you know like overlay on top and uh, draw. So some of these you might see you know textures and then um, uh, uh, other ones uh, it's just these. Okay. And so just more environment art. This is one of the train yards. And then there's other scenes that uh, sea view. So this is set in uh, Staten Island. And if you're not familiar with the area, they have like a lot of uh, sanatoriums for people with like uh, uh, more like mental uh, related, health related sort of uh, um, hospitals. And so um, from here, this is the Unreal Engine project. And so they started developing their concept, their, the actual level layout based off of the concepts I provided. And uh, at the same time, I was doing other like personal projects too. Um, and so, yeah, just a lot of like environment art, um, this one is uh, a, like a matte painting sort of style. And so from there, because I learned Unreal Engine, um, back at, uh, when I started doing portfolio reviews, I met another person at Siege who said that uh, they're looking for a uh, artist for VR that knows Unreal Engine. And so I thought it was interesting, and you know, I'll take a, take a look at it. And so I did an art test for them, and then um, they brought me on board. And so the first project I worked on with Pulseworks is um, Cos Cosmos Coaster. And so you're basically on a cart ride through uh, our solar system. And so I did some UI concepts for them. And you can see you know, when you're on Neptune, it's cold, and you know, it'll be blue. And if it's hot, it'll be orangish with a little bit of gradient. And then uh, I did like a mesh swap for the uh, right side. And so those are actual planets from the game. But I shrunk them down and put them there. So whenever you go to different planets, it'll just swap to that 3D mesh. So more concepts, and you can see, you know, um, one of the ideas we floated around, unfortunately we didn't go with it, is having weird creatures that maybe you'll, you'll fly by or have it come over you. 
Um, instead, we want something a little bit more tame on the right side, where you just have really close on objects that you might smash through or like fly by and under you know, that type of stuff. Uh, and the storyboarding. So, you know, I don't do just concepts all the time. Uh, for storyboards, it's also pretty important because there's certain moments that maybe you can't quite capture uh, with just you know, doing your concept art itself. Because you want to figure out you know, how the camera move and uh, what sort of narrations will kind of coincide with that movement too. And so this one right here is a scene on Mars with a uh, pro NASA proposed Mars base camp. And so we, one of our discussions with the art director is, you know, we'll have uh, the camera go underneath and around uh, this one structure. So, so you'll see down here in the bottom uh, right corner, uh, one part of that scene or one segment of that shot, and um, that's where the camera is actually you know, zooming under and over the uh, structure. And of course, I did marketing work. Um, Tank Commander is uh, another project we worked on. Next one. Uh, this one here is actually a very interesting project. This is uh, a arena VR shooter. So what that is, is um, if you ever go to, uh, you know, uh, like SeaGraph or some of those other uh, events that showcases, you know, VR projects, they have this giant tower, like a scaffolding, and then they'll have sensors and cameras and stuff, uh, and they have like VR, you know, headset tied to it, and you'll have these uh, guns that tracks with it. And so uh, you'll be like four other players in this little bunker area, and then you're basically shooting at robots and, you know, creatures that like attack you while you're in your face. And uh, whoever has the highest point at the end of the game wins. And the Georgia Aquarium. So if you remember what I mentioned before, we actually have uh, several uh, exhibits here before. We had a yellow submarine, and then they got moved over to the VR theater here. And then now we have another uh, experience called Drop in the Ocean that's, that's also premiering here too. So to close out, there's some lessons that I learned right through that long, long journey. Fundamentals. A lot of times people go into industry without learning you know, what fundamentals are. You know, how do you do perspective properly, lighting, uh, form, you know, when people draw characters. Sometimes the anatomy might be really wonky. Um, you know, even something over here like this. You know, I did a lot of sketches of a uh, giant octopus with like kelp-like structures and nodules, right? But a lot of times people just put stuff together because it looks good. But why are the structures on the creature, right? Like when you look at the kelp here, Maybe they use it as a way to attract prey, to camouflage themselves. Maybe there's a little bioluminescence on it to kind of add on to that, you know, uh, lower, lowering aspect to it. Um, the top part, you have a whole ecosystem of like weird plants and you have a whole explanation between that. Um, oh, sorry. So for this drawing right here, this is actually from CGMA when I was taking classes back in 2016. And so uh, if you ever have an opportunity um, to take those courses, um, it's, it's recommended because your professors are industry professionals too. So one of my uh, professor is uh, Ron Lehman, who worked on uh, Thor Dark World, I believe, is the concept that he did. Um, and so once I finished this pro this uh, assignment for him, it actually was on the front page of CGMA for about a quarter before they took it off. Um, art tests. So um, Benjamin Franklin said that there are several things that are sure in life, which is death and taxes. Well, in the art world, uh, that's art tests. Because uh, sometimes if, they, if the uh, people hiring you aren't quite sure you know, like what your skill sets are, they might give you an art test just to gauge that. And so uh, this one was for uh, America Motion Picture with Floyd County. And so um, uh, this project, they said that uh, they wanted me on the, on the project after I turned it in. But unfortunately, that was also when I got hired on by Pulseworks. So, so you know, that's something I had to let them know. Um, and sometimes might, that might happen to you. You might have like two, three, you know, people who want you to work on a project. And you just have to choose, you know, which, which is the one that interests you the most. And, um, you know, is that something that you feel like you could do, you know, for the next couple years if possible? And uh, other things I consider is uh, a lot of times in the animation industry, things are kind of in the hiatus sort of schedule, right? So you might be there for maybe a year, two years, and once the production ends, will they bring you on, or do you have to find a job after? So those are stuff you have to consider. Next. Fan art is okay. A lot of times people you know, won't worry about, you know, can they show a fan art? Your professor might say, no, don't do that. But you absolutely can't do it. And so this was for uh, one of the Blizzard contests. So yeah, Diablo was, was a part of the storm or something like that. Yeah, next one. And community. So join your local uh, animation community, uh, CIFA South, of course, Georgia Game Developer Association, Women in Animation, um, and there's more, of course. And last of all, have fun. You know, it's all stuff that I do on my free time. So, yeah.
younger, I had this, you know, no student writes still sort of uh, mentality. So, you know, whenever a professor gives you assignments, I'll sit there in the, in, in the uh, bar room all day, you know, just trying to write out these things. And I wouldn't talk to anyone. And, uh, but as I go along now, you know, you see people who are now becoming art directors or becoming senior artists. And so you don't quite know where other people might be in the future. They could become your bosses too. So being able to, you know, make friends with people and, you know, not burn bridges and stuff is really big. Uh, going to events, you know, like uh, mixers, uh, if you're going to, uh, you know, like conventions and stuff, that's an opportunity for you to just meet new people. Um, and if you're someone who might be shy, sometimes I give myself a role, you know, talk to just three people, and sometimes you might get so comfortable, you start talking to more people, and then by the end of it, you talk to everyone in the room. Uh, so you never know uh, who you might meet uh, and who might share the same, same interests with you. Too. <laughs> Go, Jack! Yes, we just want to make sure we get everybody's question. We still have any questions on Vision Hall. So, yeah, let's see who has questions for that. Yes, Cindy Jane. So uh, a lot of people might go crazy from this answer, but sometimes it, it depends. Uh, because a lot of people are like, oh, is there like a definitive answer? So if you're comfortable animating in Maya or Blender, you can always do that and then you can export that into Maya. Uh, but, uh, sorry, into Unreal Engine. But Unreal Engine 5 now also has a new system where you can actually rig things in, in the software and you can control that you know, inside of that. Um, and then there's also other formats you can do too. There are uh, LifeLink now where you can you know, do like, uh, motion control with your body, and then it also connects to the 3D rig in Unreal. And so, if you ever a chance to drop by the CMII um, at Georgia State, they have like a whole body set up with like uh, with uh, you know like those motion capture suits. And our next pro next question was, what programs do you primarily use? Oh, yeah. so uh, for graphic design, I use a lot of Photoshop, Illustrator, um, InDesign. Uh, 
Um, I also use After Effects uh, if we're doing movies. Um, and Premiere Pro once in a while, I'm doing stuff that's less intensive and doesn't need a lot of animation. For 3D, um, I would say for right now it's Maya because um, that's being paid for. But uh, I also love Blender a lot. There's so much you can do with Blender and it's free. Um, yeah, I mean, there's even like a sculpting uh, um, fun, uh, feature in there that's very similar to ZBrush. If you haven't used it, check it out. Um, and then Unreal Engine. I mean, I really in love with Unreal Engine right now. Unity is good too, back in the day. Um, but I think what won me over with Unreal is a lot of the free assets they give. Um, back during 2021 or during the pandemic, they gave out like $3 million worth of free graphic assets. You know, they have, um, was it like the meshes, um, high 8K you know, textures and stuff. Um, and even once a month, they have other free assets, you know, like animation stuff, um, game templates you can use. So. All right, and we're going to go to an audience question. So, following up on the programs, uh, <laughs> Blender's great. Uh, for being free, I was curious about other cheap to free alternatives for students after they no longer have their student licenses and they're still trying to create and work because Photoshop's expensive. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, so there is, Krita is one of them, and then another one, I used to use this like GIMP, and you know, it has layers as well too, um, but there's also one for like Fire Alpaca is also another free one too, so um, I mean, it's something to check out too. I, I, I know that uh, you know, a lot of us are kind of cash strapped, and we don't want to feed you know, the system either, <laughs> so to say. Our next question, it has two votes. How do you recommend beginners getting into learning about Unreal Engine? Slash, what do you like or dislike about Unreal? And if you need me to repeat it, it is up to you. Oh, good enough. Well, I need to look up sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes look up. Uh, okay. So uh, to learn Unreal, uh, they have a lot of free tutorials already, which is why another aspect of why I love it. Um, they have a lot of free projects, free templates. They have a lot of um, videos on YouTube. A lot of people who are showing you know how to set up different things. Uh, they have templates for virtual production if you want to use cameras with that. Uh, they have game design template for um, like either side scroller, but I recommend. But that one is a little bit iffy. Like side scrollers have like other uh, or two D games have other um, platforms that you could use too. Um, Unity would be one of them. And uh, there's one other I don't remember. It's like Good Dome or something like that. Um, then there is, uh, you know, your traditional 3D and VR templates. Those are also really good too, so take a look at those. All right. Thank you, thank you. And our next one is, I am working on my senior, I am working on my senior portfolio and want to get into doing concept art. What would you recommend including in that portfolio? So that, so again, my answer would be that depends, right? Um, where are you trying to target? You know, who, like, which studio do you want to work for? Um, are you able to work in their style? Have you researched and what sort of positions are open? Um, and be very targeted with stuff because you don't want to do a, a, a shotgun effect. Because let's say you include a bunch of you know like still life drawings and life drawings and all they're looking for is something to background. Then you just wasted all your time you know giving them something that they never asked for. Um, now that said, if it's on your website, you know just for like the portfolio, like I like if you were to go to my website, um, <laughs> sometimes you can do like a 70 30 or 80 20 spread where. Um, 80% is stuff that you really, really want to do, and 20% it would be stuff that you know you'd be okay with doing, um, and it's like adjacent to to um, you know what you like. So the, first, so the first thing you'll notice is I put concept art and 3D art at the very top, and then uh, all the other stuff like graphic models and graphic designs are towards the bottom. But yeah. Mm -hmm. And I separate out with environment, because I know my strongest part is my environment work. I think. And then characters and creatures will probably be next. Um, and I have a few things that might be vehicles or stuff that could be characters and vehicles. Don't forget to vote, because more votes will answer this first. Hello, uh, Jeff. So, 
I was actually going to ask about like the portfolio thing, but then you kind of answered it. So I'll go on to my second question on that. Um, so right now I'm working on this, my senior film, and I'm actually using Unreal Engine to render it. Um, do you have any like tips or suggestions for like um, tricks for getting Unreal uh, renders to look uh, really nice or things that you use uh, in your work? Uh, yeah, so one of it would be making sure you know all your lightings and stuff are set up properly because um, if you are trying to render it out, sometimes you can have like weird artifacts, you might have like weird seed fighting and stuff. So I would say render early to make sure you know things look good. A lot of times people start rendering the day of and realize oh there's like issues with it and they go back trying to troubleshoot that. So try to find those issues early. Um, another thing is look at the render queue. Uh, it's like a window or format because from there. You can actually do like layered renders, and so uh, if you find that it's taking a long time to you know get your scenes to come out when you render that, you can actually just render do like short render passes or like float them back on objects or whatever you know you save it to different layers. Yep. Awesome. And our next question is, what's the best way to keep sharpening those fundamental skills after leaving college, and what other skills are essential for the concept slash animation industry? Oh, that's a that's a good one. Uh, so to keep sharp afterwards, um, you know, you, you just have to keep. It's either you use it or lose it. So um, even when I was working at some of these companies during lunchtime, I'll just do like one hour to write a speed sketch. And so um, a couple of stuff I may have shown, maybe not. But uh, yeah, you know, you, you just sit down, you know, while you're eating, I'll probably just pop it on, do like one or two shots, um, just uh, just to get that out. Uh, same thing with remodeling too. You know, just if you have time, try to at least make something. Um, other than that, what was the second question? <laughs> what are other essential for concept? Uh, definitely timing is one. You know, getting your your key your key poses and stuff down. Uh, understanding you know like the movement arcs and stuff. Uh, anticipation. A lot of times when I review people's portfolio, like a C-Graph, for example, I'll notice when someone's running, they try to just go straight into the run. But when you start, sometimes you kind of pull back a bit and then you go. Because sometimes you have like uh, that force that kind of, you know, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you put it? It's almost like there's like a equal and opposite reaction, right? So sometimes you might have a little bit of that pull back before you go. Same thing with punches. Like when you watch some anime, you might notice that the motions feel kind of stiff because you're just kind of doing this. But when you pull back and then you punch, you kind of get more force in that sort of like arc of motion. Um, when you draw characters, sometimes people draw them and they're very stiff. Right. But when you but when you start looking at people when they're standing, sometimes it might lean a little bit, and then uh, when you draw the center line, it might that, that might shift a bit, and it gives it that more naturalistic feel. Um, and same thing if they're like in dynamic poses. Sometimes um, you know the legs aren't going to be this one stick, and if you're using those uh, stick mannequins for like a you know, reference, those are terrible. You should, you, know, you should not be working off of that after you you know uh, got into sub uh, like a intermediate sort of level. Like if you're doing live drawing, that's the way to do it. Um, if you need to look at videos of you know gymnasts and stuff performing, uh, I, I highly recommend doing that too. That's so cool. All right. Question? Yeah. Is there an in-person question? There is one. I was wondering if you've ever felt imposter syndrome in school or while you were working in the industry. Um, does that ever go away, or how do you deal with that, or did you ever experience that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, and uh, that's a really good one. Um, I mean, sometimes, like even today, I felt the imposter syndrome. Um, there, are you familiar with the term called Dunning-Kruger effect? So this is where like people who don't know what they're doing are very confident in their abilities, and then people who aren't tend to give you know that like independence. I mean, people who are um, a little bit more knowledgeable will be like independence, and it, that is kind of the case because you know everything kind of changes, and you start understanding what sort of factors will affect what you're doing. And so um, in that sort of case, um, yeah, like I, I still do feel that. Um, and how do I get over that? Um, I mean, you just keep keeping on. You know, you just keep producing, and then you know wherever you go, if if, if you get better, people will acknowledge that too. And when you start saying your stuff is good, um, you know that's a good confidence boost as well. Um, but after some time, you start creating stuff for yourself as well. Um, you know, like when I edited the last slide where I drew the strudel sloth, you know that that's because I just want to draw. One. So. All right, and our last question is: What are the 
And our next question is, I'd like to get better at drawing slash painting environments. Do you have a particular workflow for that type of work? Is there anything about it that you find tedious? So um, it can get tedious when, depending on how complex your environment is. Um, part of it is understanding, you know, when you're drawing, uh, if you're doing a speed paint, for example, I like to work from background and foreground, um, and I like to block out um, the major silhouette elements first. You know, like, what is your focal point? Uh, where things are overlapping so you can create like a framing and stuff like that. Um, and then you always check for your values because a lot of times people tend to muddy things up a little bit where, um, you know, the foreground and background colors are very similar and um, it becomes very hard to like, separate that out. Um, also understanding, you know, the time of day is also very important too. Um, a lot of artists use the golden hour, which is around like 4 to 6 p.m mainly because that's when you know, your lighting creates these really long, elegant shadows, and then the lighting has that uh, nice modeling effect on, a, on an object. So if you ever go out and just take a look at you know, any sort of object that's out in the sun at that time period, you'll notice that uh, it feels a little bit more well lit than if the sun's directly from the top. And because when it's you know, directly from the top, it feels a little bit more artificial. Awesome. And our next question, and also have a comment, what internships did you get into? Also, can you give some advice on getting internships? With the comment, that is, is there any advice you can give when it comes to art tests in particular to be sure you are picked? So for the internships, um, I, would, I would recommend speaking to your professors. Um, when I was at SCAD, uh, we had a professor called Tony Tang, uh, who was part of the IPGM department. And uh, I remember when I was in my Final year at SCAD, he mentioned that uh, Pyrus had an internship, and uh, the day for the dead or the deadline for us to turn our application was pretty much the day I heard about it. And so I filled out my application, I put everything to my CD, and I ran, you know, down to the DMC building, the Digital Media Center. And uh, when I got to his room, his door was already closed. And so by that point, I could have just given up and just walked back. Right? So I took my package and I just slid underneath his door and I just left. And then the next day, I got an email back. And and said, hey, you know, you got the internship, and you know, can you start? <laughs> so that worked out. <laughs> so sometimes you kind of have to read that tenacity as well, too. And you know, yes, sometimes you know you might feel like, oh, I might not get it, but you do it anyway. Um, now, in terms of uh, art tests, so the big thing I would recommend is look at the brief, right? Because um, they'll send you, you know, your the, their brand guide, they'll send you, you know, any sort of thing related to a uh, beat on model with the character. Um, if, or if it's an environment character, you know, regardless, they'll tell you, you know, what it is they're looking for, you know, time of day, all that type of stuff. Make sure you read through all of that. Um, you know, it's like if you're a chef and someone asks for, I don't know, like a sunny side up, egg, but you gave a scrambled egg, that's a no-no. So you want to be aware of that type of stuff. Um, also, be in contact with the person who is administering your test at all times because if you need an extension and stuff, you know, let them know. You know maybe you have like a family emergency. If they don't know what's going on, imagine if it's at work too. If you know your boss doesn't know what's going on, then um, you know that could affect things. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any in-person questions? Awesome. And by the way, we have about 12 minutes left, so keep in mind. So, um, how do you keep going um, doing art? Yeah, even though you're doing like maybe a nine to five job or whichever, I guess. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, I mean, there's also days where even I get art blocks, right? Like I'll be drawing my sketchbook and I'm like, I hate what I'm drawing. You know, like this this face, this person's face is just dog water. So, so um, the thing is, you you just keep drawing. You know, it's like when you get a writer's block, you keep writing. And then eventually something kind of comes. Sometimes I even just take 15 minutes, like, you know, take a walk around the neighborhood. I use the restroom, I take a shower or something, I lie down, take a nap, and suddenly something just comes to me. Um, there's, there's so many times where, like, I'm in a shower and suddenly something just pops in, and I'm like, oh, I should have just done that. And then I'll just go and, you know, add that in. So, yeah, sometimes you need to know how to step away for a little bit and come back at it. That's great. All right, and our next one is, what is your creative process when developing concept designs in 2D um, so, what I would recommend to begin, uh, as process-wise, is definitely research. Um, so, when you get a brief, um, sometimes it might be stuff I'm not familiar with, like maybe it's a culture you know, that I'm not familiar with. 
Um, and so I'll go out there, you know, read some stuff. I might talk to people who might who might have some knowledge about it. Um, you know, watch videos, and then from there I can start doing sketches based off of what I've seen. And then I'll send little sketches over to um, uh, whoever is you know managing a project. Or if it's for my own stuff, I look at it and see you know if that's something that clicks with me or if I really like it. And I'll do you know maybe 10 to 20 sketches before I settle on something. Um, and part of it is uh, you know when it comes to ideation, sometimes your first idea might not be the best one. And other times it might be, but you don't know until you try a couple of things. Um, and then from there, you know, um, then you can start doing my, uh, if I get my sketches, I'll start adding some colors in. Um, you know, I'll try exploring like breakdowns of different things. If it's a character, you know, what sort of uh, items do they, do they wear? You know, do they have rings? Are they carrying watches? Do they have a purse? You know, uh, what might they have on their purse, right? Do they have any pins? Um, do they have an item that maybe their mother gave them? Um, if, you, if you're in a zombie apocalypse, someone has like a fire axe, maybe there's little notches on there, there's like eight notches, maybe that's how many zombies they took out. You know, and you start thinking deep into these type of things when you're creating uh, character environments and that type of concepts. Because um, remember, like, when you're doing concepts and storytelling, and you're, you're combining, you know, that visual illustration aspect with graphic design presentation and storytelling all at the same time. And a lot of times people mix concept art with illustration, and they mix it up with graphics, and they mix it with animation, it's neither of those. It's actually a little bit of all of those kind of combined together. Mm -hmm. All right, and we have two more audience questions, I believe. Hi, thank you so much. You had such an awesome presentation, and I was hoping that you could tell us your thoughts on AI and the possibilities of it affecting concept and the industry at large. Tool, thread, what do you think? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> I knew someone was eventually going to ask AI uh, related question because it is a, it is a hot topic. Um, there is a lot of um, you know people who who are uh, who feel ambivalent about it. Some people who are very excited about it, and uh, you know the big thing is you know it's already kind of out of the bag. So to say like oh get rid of technology, it's really hard to do. Um, but at the same time though, um, you know if people are using it as a way to like replace ours and stuff, that can't be an issue because that is our livelihood too. Um, and I do see the benefits of being able to increase my output and stuff like that. So I, I do suggest people to learn at least what it can do because you never know where it might fit into your pipeline. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, letting studios and uh, people who are making policies know um, about you know your concerns because a lot of times they're just going to pave over it if no one complains about it. And so, um, if you're able to at least have a hand in, you know, notifying, you know, people you're electing and stuff like that, be active in politics. A lot of times, people are like, "Oh, one vote doesn't matter," but in some cases, it does. And there's been several cases this year alone where elections were decided by just like one or two votes. Um, and so, you know, your opinions do matter. Um, and especially in the AI part, it is a new technology, and you know, it is gonna. It's not just gonna be in our. It's gonna be in your cars. It's gonna be in your phones. It's gonna be in your toaster, your refrigerator. So, um, yeah, like. Learning how to you know live in that sort of world is going to be where our next phase is going to be. So yeah. Toaster, toast Bob Ross onto my toast. Um, <laughs> and with dynamic pricing and fast food and whatnot, that's probably going to become a thing as well. So yeah. So either you buy that or you learn how to make your own food. <laughs> Wendy's just walked that back. What? Wendy's walked that back real quick. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wait, did, did I didn't know that. Yeah, they've already walked it back. That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know that. All right, and our next question was, hello, hey. Um, my question was, so you talked about earlier how you got offered that position at Foy, but you had another obligation with another studio that you went over. Like, whenever that happens, like, what is your take on, if you have more than one person reach out to you, is it more like you have to choose one, or is there ever a time where you can do both obligations, or? Is that more of a discretionary thing, with, um, especially because you do own your own company? Like, what is your take on if an employee were to do that or yourself doing it? So there's always room for negotiation, is what I would say. Regardless of you, you can always find ways to flip it around. Um, like even uh, with some companies, you know, I'll talk with them and say, "Hey, look, you know, I do some freelance stuff on the side, but it has nothing to do with, that, with with what I'm doing at my current job." And sometimes they'll say, "Cool," and then that's like, "Okay," because uh, what I tell them is, "Hey, if I find other stuff out there, right, like either you know, new." information or new techniques and stuff, I'll bring it to this company, uh, to this job at least, you know, ways to bolster it. I can, you know, maybe even connect you to other people that, uh, you know, are in the industry too. And so, you know, it can turn into a win-win sort of thing. And if they're not 
you know, it, uh, open to that, then it's up to you to decide, you know, do you really want to go with one option over the other? Um, and so, you know, when you just got brought in, you have the, op you have the option to at least negotiate. Um, and also, like, be on, a, on the lookout for red flags because they might try to, you know, tell you one thing and then do another, and, you know, that type of stuff. Thank you. concept you favored environments more right? what pushed you during college to like figure that out because right now you, there's so many so much going on in the industry it's hard to figure out what you really want to do so what pushed you to do that so I think it's because I love taking photos of you know just everything I see when I go traveling it's often I realize my photos are mostly of buildings and stuff mm -hmm. than the people except my lovely wife <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I think it's just um, when it comes to uh, environments, a lot of times people find they like doing characters a lot. Like you go on um, um, even just art stations, a lot of people do you know portraits and stuff. But um, even environments have a lot of character to them, right? Um, you look at like an empty room. What does that tell you about that room? Is it like you know very sterile? Because then that means it, 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 it could be well kept, but it could be a very you know uninvited environment. But then you look at someone's bedroom, right? You might see things are kind of kept. Um, but that means it's been lived in, and it might feel kind of cozy. Um, you might have like a cat in a corner, and then you know you might have a plant there, and that's and it's alive, meaning that someone's been taking care of it and it's watered. So um, you know, like it's something I feel is often neglected, but it's also very important because you can't just have a character with like nothing around it. Yeah. yeah. All right, we have three more minutes because there are another question. No, I'll ask. What do you so? They're saying that um, they're saying that the um, like agreement for animation is coming up, and a lot of people are kind of worried if there's going to be an animation strike by chance. How would that affect the Atlanta industry since it's not really a unionized industry here? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, we've seen the writer strike and uh, you know the ones with the um, down down in uh, California, so. Uh, it's likely that it will affect the industry here, unfortunately. But you know, we kind of also have to understand. You know, it might be needed in the sense that if the students are going to take advantage of artists as well, um, you know, how do you work that type of stuff up? It's really hard to say. Um, you know, we've heard about some unionization going on in one of the studios here. I'm not going to name any names. Um, and we saw how that turned out. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think I think this is a question I would probably play close to my chest right now because I have my own opinions about things, um, and it's something to kind of look at as it develops. Um, but you know, if you don't make waves, you know, sometimes things won't change either. Yeah. I'll just leave it at that. Um, do you have any advice on what people could do in the meantime when there is a shortage of jobs, like how they can develop their skills or other pathways that might not affect? or um, hurt this strike if it's happening that might like, not be scrubbing hours? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Because I remember back in 2008 when I graduated, from, oh, sorry, 2012 when I graduated from SCAD, um, that was also a time period when a lot of people were having a tough time finding jobs. I mean, some of my friends, you know, they were going on hiatus and stuff. When I got out, you know, I applied to hundreds of companies and no one would ever get back to me. So that's why you saw uh, during that time period when I said I had no job, I was just you know going for internships. Uh, you know, I'll work on other game dev project, trying to create some project of my own. Um, I forgot I didn't mention that when I went to GGDA before I got that paid internship at Cool Mini. Um, you know, I was working on my own graphic novel, and I went to that Kickstarter event because I was going to look at kickstarting my own project. It just so happens that when I was there, that someone was actually looking for a graphic designer, and that, that was my in. So one of the things I recommend is you know look outside of just you know the art field. There's a lot of other industries that also need artists. You know programmers, people who are engineers, medical sort of stuff. Um, you know they all need art, uh, art or design at some level. Children's books. Children's books, yeah. So yeah, and you can even create your own projects. There's a lot of people who who do stuff on YouTube and Twitch and stuff. You know VTubers, they create their own animation. Odd ones out was working at Subway and he created his own you know comic, video blog and then now he's doing animation now too. So there's a lot of different avenue, and you know if one thing shuts down, you know what? Find another way in. Kickstarter your own short film, you know. 
Yeah, there's a lot. And uh, Wasan over here has also been looking at uh, finding funding, you know, for well, some of those have been looking for funding for you know filmmakers and stuff. And if there's a way to you know bring that to Atlanta, that'd be great too. And come to mixers. Yeah, come to these mixers. Hang out with people who are going through it too. Not right. Yeah. So we're gonna close this off, but that doesn't mean that the mixer is over. We would love for you guys to keep talking with each other. And for those of you who are asking about other events, how to find grants and stuff, don't forget to go on our website, in our resource page. We have like a film festival list. We have uh, some list of some uh, really good resources like animation studio maps. We're working on some wage maps. And we're all, and also there's like mixers for other places. So for some of you who are interested in grants, um, just know that you know animation grants are not as common as film grants but there are film grants, so you should definitely check out film grants. Like right now on Film Impact Georgia, they also have film grants uh, open. So you can check out their organization. It's also on our website, uh, inside of like the networking upstairs a little bit. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Up, oh no, no, that's the map, but you can see on the top right, that's where events and stuff are. And if you want to get grants, the best way is to talk to people who are giving the grants. Uh, I know, Sunidhi, you also did something with that as well, too. Did you want to put a little bit of information for people? So, my professor, just get really close with your professors um, and just talk to them like they're people because then they'll talk to you like you're a person, which helps. And um, if you do your work and show that you are really passionate, sometimes they'll be like, hey, I have a friend at this place and they're looking for internships. And then if you I strongly recommend networking. So if you have LinkedIn, especially LinkedIn Premium, they really get you with that free trial. But um, keep it because you can just reach out to people without having to connect with them, and usually they will respond. And you can be like, hey, I saw that you worked here. I applied for an internship. I would love to learn about the work culture or just get to know you. And it just tends to help them remember you because if people are hiring or trying to take you on for an internship, um, they're more likely to say yes to someone that they kind of have a face to or a personality to. It's kind of like an empathy thing. It's just, oh, this is a person, I've connected with them, and that helps them. So, sweet. Thank you. So, um, I think uh, snacks are still open until another 30 minutes, so if anybody yeah. wants to come on and get back. <laughs> and yes, please mingle and uh, meet with each other, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs>